that was beautiful, Lisa. Thank you. Was that from that new music book? No, actually. Okay, just ask. And just, okay. Welcome, everybody, to Metropolitan Community Church of Albuquerque on this third Sunday of Advent, a Sunday of joy, and today is the day we get to light the pink candle. Not pink because Mary was expecting a girl, but uh, <laughs> it's just for joy. So, uh, Everyone sign in on the attendance registers located in the seat pockets in front of you. And if you've not worshipped with us before, you've never completed a welcome card, please do so. And if you bring that to me following worship, we will have a gift for you just to thank you for being a part of our Sunday morning and your Sunday morning. I, I know there's many things you can be doing on Sunday morning including sleeping in. I know a lot of people, I, I met with somebody the other day and they said, I just can't get out of bed on Sundays. I work so hard all week. I said, I get it. You know, I said, well, watch us, you know, watch us when you can online. So, so don't, we don't guilt, no guilt, judgment, this is a judgment-free zone here is what I always say. We don't judge people. So a um, couple of announcements. Um, our Christmas Eve worship service, we'll still do our 1030 a.m. worship service next Sunday. And then we'll do our 6 p.m. Christmas Eve candlelight meal, a uh, din dinner, worship. And we're, do we're doing a social from 5 to about 5.45 with just some light refreshments um, if you want to come for that. We're still collecting coats um, for the people. And there's also a toy drive going on. So if you want to bring toys or coats in, uh, we would love to be able to distribute those. And our, also somebody, I guess they really were an avid reader, took most of our books out of our book library out front, so we need some adult books, not porn books, but, you know, a, for, re, just, <laughs> books for that adults read. <laughs> I mean, they can be a little racy. Uh, so I used to do, I used to read those love stories when I was a young teenager. Okay. <laughs> um, Many of you may know uh, Mauro Walden Montoya. He was one of our heroes in the LGBTQ community, and he passed away yesterday. Um, he, he lived with HIV and AIDS uh, for many, many years, and he was in Washington, D.C. during the um, 1980s and uh, was helping people get on disability because he was a lawyer. And then he moved here and um, did some other things. He worked with Equality New Mexico and with Albuquerque Pride. He was in the leather community and he was a, a great speaker. Um, and I, I'll share with you what I posted on, on his page because I'm just it's kind of just something I felt I needed to share. We will mourn the loss of Mara Walden Montoya. He was a wonderful person who worked hard for our community a hero who will be missed. May the loving arms of the divine embrace Andy and Morrow's many friends and family. Morrow, well done, till we meet again. And I'm gonna share with you a reading from Tekumish, I think is how you pronounce that. When your time comes to die, be not like those whose hearts are filled with fear of death, so that when their time comes, they weep and pray for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way. Sing your death song and die like a hero going home. Uh, Mara will see you again one day. So, uh, Also one of our members in the, very involved in the court, uh, passed away. Her name was Dominique, I believe. So she passed away unexpectedly. Yeah, and she was very young, so uh, I know the community's mourning that loss too. And You know, we're used to having a lot of losses in our community with HIV and AIDS, if you were around during then. And uh, in many ways, we are a very wounded community from that. There was so many scars left from that. But, but we still are very resilient, and we've moved on. And I think we're kind of a tribe of people that can really teach the world something. And that's why I do what I do, is that I think my job is to kind of empower people to, to live their lives authentically, uh, with truth, and uh, to, to walk this earth gently and with love. So. So let's transition from getting here to being here. I know it's the Christmas season. There's many things that we get involved in. So let's take a deep breath. Just breathe in the breath of God. Know that our time together today is sacred and that each one of us has a divine appointment with God, our creator. So today, we will read the words of Isaiah, who offers us a prophetic vision that Jesus claims for his ministry. 
Likewise, we too are called to claim the gift of being fully present with all people, those who mourn, those who grieve, those who have suffered indignity and oppression. Mary is magnificent, is prophetic as well. She claims the overturning of injustice even before it has come to pass. In the difficulty of her situation, she sings with joy about the very real presence of God growing within her. On this Sunday, we unwrap a present on this third Sunday of Advent with great anticipation for the gift that God will reveal. We open our hearts as we open the gift. The gift of joy is not the equivalent of happiness, but rather the deep conviction that we are called to be present in the work of bringing about great things, a better world for those who need it the most. So today we light this candle of joy as a sign that we will be present with joy in our world. Holy living light of God, you are our joyful presence. May this joy grow in our lives each day so that we can be a present of joy to others. Unwrap and open our hearts. May it be so. Amen.
Elizabeth is the context for a description of joy that resides even in the midst of uncertainty and possible harm to Mary, the young pregnant woman at the margin of society. She believes with her whole heart that the child in her womb is just as the angel declared, a gift from God, of God, the holiest matters. As soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. But why am I so favored that the mother of the Messiah should come to me? The moment your greeting reached my ears, the child in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed that what our God said to her would be accomplished, Mary said. My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you, my Savior. For you have looked with favor upon your lowly ser servant, and from this day forward, all generations will call me blessed. For you, the Almighty, have done great things for me, and holy is your name. Your mercy reaches from age to age for those who fear you. You have shown strength with your arm. You have scattered the proud in their conceit. You have deposed the mighty from their thrones and raised the lowly to high places. You have filled the hungry with good things while you have sent the rich away empty. You have come to the aid of Israel, your servant, mindful of your mercy, the promise you made to our ancestors, to Sarah and Abraham and their descendants forever. Oh, 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 oh. 
Badger Lane, whom the choirs of angels praise. Mary, Joseph, lend your aid, all our hearts in love we raise. Oh, 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 oh. in Excelsis Deo. Oh, So this Sunday is Joy Sunday, whereas we have the pink candle lit. Our Advent wreath this year is purple, and usually Advent candles are either purple or royal blue. Now some folks get bent all out of shape over which color <laughs> you pick for Advent. We tend to switch back and forth. So we'll blue, use blue one year and then purple the next, and since Lent is always purple, it's nice to sometimes add the blue in on Advent. But today we get to light the pink candle, which is a reminder to us not that Mary and Joseph were hoping for a girl, um, but it's to focus on joy. Now joy, I'm talking about something that's way deeper than just happiness. Happiness kind of holds hands with pleasure, at least the way I'm using the word today, and tends to come from circumstances. We get happy if we go on vacation and go to a special place and see something magnificent, or we go see friends or relatives. We get happy maybe when we gather with people and have a good time or when we go to a Lobos game, or whatever it is that makes you happy. Um, you're happy at that. It's an event or a circumstance. But joy, it, it comes from deep within us. And it is there if we feed it and allow it to continue to blossom. As I reflected on joy, I realized that for me, it comes from having a sense of awe, A-W-E, and gratitude. I'm not sure one can feel happiness when one is feeling sad or depressed. But when you have joy, even though you may be sad and depressed, you still have that joy deep down inside you. Now the prophet Isaiah in chapter 61 talks about a great joy when we know and do what is right. This scripture was powerful in the time when the Babylonian exile was over. And the Hebrew people needed the words to express their praise and thanks to God. And it was powerful when Jesus stood up in the temple and used the same words from the prophet Isaiah to refer to the heart of the purpose of his ministry, salvation from oppression and the joy of God continues to proceed through the ages hand in hand. I'll share with you some words from the book of Isaiah. God has sent me to bring good news to those who are poor and to heal broken hearts, to proclaim release to those held captive and liberation to those in prison, and to announce a year of favor and the day of God's vindication, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to give them a wreath of flowers instead of ashes, I will joyfully exalt in Yahweh, who is the joy of my soul. Now, many of you may be familiar with Brene Brown. She's a sociologist who's done a, um, several really good books, and she does a lot of TED Talks. Says, she says that the most terrifying and difficult emotion for us to feel is joy. Now, she draws big crowds when she speaks, and when she's talking about this subject, she'll ask the parents in the audience, Raise your hand if you've ever stood over your child while he or she was sleeping. And Trudy, can you probably relate and Ray relate to me on this? Anybody who has children in here, and you look at them, especially when there's those, they're that sweet little newborn babies, when they're teenagers, not so much, but <laughs> you pray different things then. But that just sweetness, that innocence, and you have I, this love I didn't know was possible. I know the minute my child was born, I just I was in love, and I was never the same after that. I was profoundly changed. But then we also, in that split second of deep joy, we think, oh, God, what if something bad happens? You know, and hundreds of hands go up because we're so afraid when we have that joy that something bad might happen, and yes, bad things do happen. Um, 
but joy can sustain us through them. How many of you have ever sat up and said, wow, work's going really good. Uh, my relationship with my partner's great. My parents seem to be doing OK. Everything's going well, but holy crap, what's going to happen next? <laughs> and hundreds of hands will go up, because we think like that. She explains that it is because we don't soften into the moment of joy because we're scared. We're scared it's going to be snatched away from us, and that will hurt way too much. When we lose our tolerance to being vulnerable, joy becomes foreboding, she says. And so what we do in moments, in moments of joyfulness is we try to beat vulnerability to the punch. So we dress rehearse tragedy to beat vulnerability to the punch. What Brown's research has shown is that when people who can lean into joy, she likes to use that expression, lean into being vulnerable, lean into joy, who can short circuit the reflex to beat vulnerability to the punch, are people who practice gratitude. She distinguishes between an attitude of gratitude and a practice of gratitude. The practice of gratitude is intentional. It can be as simple as keeping a gratitude journal and just writing down just brief little notes throughout the day. You know, I saw a beautiful sunset today. You know, the snow on the mountains was beautiful as I woke up this morning. Each day, though, you give gratitude for something. It might be just you wake up in the morning, you don't want to write it down, but you say, God, Thank you for this beautiful day. Now, Brown has noticed that we live in a culture of scarcity rather than sufficiency or blessing. And I, can, I, I see that all the time. And one of the things we do because of that culture of scarcity is that we chase the extraordinary. Sure, I, well, no, I wouldn't want to live like some of the people live that are mil millionaires and billionaires. I would love to be able to give the money away. That would be awesome to just give, give and give and give to people in need and address our problems. But when we choose the extraordinary, we miss the blessings of just the ordinary day of life, the miracles in the ordinary parts of our lives. Sometimes people will be complaining about this and that, and I'll say, you know, at least you're not in Gaza or Ukraine. You have a, you had a roof over your shoulder. You have friends and family that support and love you. You might not have enough money to take a vacation, but you got food in your house, you drive a car, you got a good job. Too often, we miss it because we're not grateful for the life that we have and what we have been given. And so we miss that joy. We have to really work at sometimes cultivating a practice of being gratitude. You're, been on Facebook, how many people do Facebook here? And Okay, we need to have a little Facebook lesson then. <laughs> I know, it's technology is a blessing and a curse is what I always say. But, um, you know, some people, they're always negative. I don't care if the, you know, if somebody would walk up and say, you want a million dollars, why wasn't it two million, you know? But they're always complaining and I just, I kind of just don't do, read their stuff and because there's always something that you want to say something positive about to lift people up. Now, theologian Willie James Jennings, I love his name, says he looks at joy as an act of resistance against all the forces of despair. And joy, in that regard, is a work that becomes a state of mind, a way of life, and it resists despair and all the ways the despair wants to drive us toward death and wants to make death the final world. And death in this regard is not simply the end of our lives, but is death and all its signatures. Death, violence, war, debt, and all the ways in which life can be strangled and presented to us as not worth living. People give up too easily and live in a culture of scarcity instead of gratitude. Joy makes a productive use of our pain and our suffering and the absurd, not that we take them lightly, but to take them very seriously, but not to make them gods. 
It won't be our final story that we tell as one of despair. Hopefully it will be one of joy no matter what we go through. I went through a difficult time, but I knew that God was with me, and I just held on to Jesus as tight as I could, and I got through it. If you start changing your mind and thinking like that, it's, it can really help during times of despair. He explains how this can be done. Practically, to cultivate joy, you have to have people who you've heard sing those songs in strange lands. You have to have people who have been able to make you laugh in the places where all you want to do is cry. You have to have conditions set up where those people who have learned to ride the winds of chaos can say to you, come on, let me show you how to do that. I think that's the first thing you have to have. And then the second thing you have to have is a willingness to want to hold on to life, even when there is very little that makes sense in life. Joy is the currency that is flowing between, between hands in such situations. When our energies have to be focused on survival, it doesn't leave a lot of energy for overt forms of complaint. Now, there can be complaint, but we spend a lot of energy just trying to hold it all together. The work of joy becomes serious work. And this is where we can hear the echoes of Mary's song about a world that can be turned right side up. In Luke's gospel reading, we heard the encounter between Elizabeth and Mary. Mary was older, and uh, I mean, Elizabeth was older, and Mary was her cousin. They were cousins. And Elizabeth was probably showing by the time Mary got to her. And Mary was probably just maybe just a little baby bump, as we call it. Elizabeth at the time was probably still adjusting to a pregnancy so late in life. I imagine Mary is still in turmoil after the angel had visited her that has led to her pregnancy and all the social consequences just being pre pre pregnant was going to cause her, let alone all the adjustments that were going to be required of her for motherhood. At the same time, I think these two women were also experiencing the joy of seeing each other and the joy that each one of them was carrying a special child. For Elizabeth, it was as physical as feeling the child in her body that kicked or moved. Her delight at seeing Mary tumbled out of her, of her in a heap of blessing to Mary. She blesses Mary, and she is in awe at the blessing she's experiencing because of Mary's visit. And then Mary burst out into a song, My soul magnifies God. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Now, Mary was seen as a nobody. She was a peasant, a woman, a citizen of a backwater occupied country. She sang of a world in which the rich would be sent away empty and the hungry would be filled with good things. Her song was praise to God. And in that act of praise, Mary was filled with joy even as she faced an uncertain future. As I said earlier, joy is an act of resistance against all the forces of despair. When you magnify God, when you lift up God's name, you put yourself in the company of divinity and surround yourself with God's glory and the shine rubs off. My uh, very first pastor, when I was an adult, it was a charismatic group we met in the living room. And she used to say, you know, we. We're supposed to praise God every day, and I, I follow that. You praise God every day. When you do that, there's a, a company of angels that surround you, and you can feel it. You can feel this divine presence. And go in the shower and try doing it if you're embarrassed to do it in the house if somebody's there with you and you don't want anybody to hear you. But just thank God for all that you have, all that you are, all that will, help, will come your way. Uh, praise God for being a God that continues to reach out with grace and love and forgiveness to us. So many people walk through life treated as if they were invisible. Maybe you can identify as that, being a nobody. You're out in the world, but not seen. You're treated as a nobody instead of as a somebody. And I think perhaps everyone, including myself, has treated others like nobodies plenty of times in restaurants, in hotels, airports, dealing with faceless customer service representatives on the phone. What about if we tried to be present to others with joy by saying something kind to them? 
have a great day. When I tell people have a great day or thank you for your service or be safe, thank you for working, and people get this shocked look sometimes, like, what? You're not going to complain? And um, You know, it's, it's so much easier to be kinder and nicer, I found, than complaining about everything. I just I pick my battles that are worth fighting, and because somebody got an order wrong at McDonald's drive-through, I'm not going to lose. I'm not going to get upset over that. We're, people make mistakes. So, what do we need to do to be present with joy? We need to practice gratitude. We need to lean into being vulnerable, and we need to become aware of the blessings and the miracles of the ordinary days of our lives. Mary said yes to bearing a child. She was only about 13 or 14 at the time, very young. Joseph was older. And after they got married, this couple had to go to Bethlehem for the census. I imagine they passed different villages and landmarks. They probably also went through different stages of processing what is happening. Surprise, fear, confusion, awkwardness, discomfort. Planning, dreaming, conceding, craving, and worry are all in that mix of emotions and realities that they will experience. It's an incredibly human experience, even as they participate in something with eternal consequences for our world. This is all part of our Advent journey as we travel to Bethlehem. Joy and wonder can coexist even when there is heartbreak and confusion. Remember that the gift of joy is not the equivalent of happiness, but rather the deep conviction that we are called to be present in the work of bringing about great things, a better world for those who need it most. The places, the people that need joy where I can make myself more present this week are. I want you to think about that for a minute. Who are some people that could use a little bit of joy in their life? Where's a place you can go where there is no joy? Think of one act that you could possibly do to bring joy to somebody. It could be as easy as picking up the phone and just calling somebody and just say, hey, you're on my mind, and I'm thinking of you. So I invite us on this Advent journey this week to join with Mary in practicing joy as an act of resistance against the forces of despair. When we are present with joy, we too will magnify those around us and maybe even ourselves in the process. And that truly will bring more joy to our world. Amen and God bless you.
as we have done for the last, if you're comfortable, if you're comfortable, you can take the hand of this person sitting next to you. The first question is this. Who was a gift of presence to you this week? Did you experience their attention in a way that felt like a special connection? Take a moment to recall this in your mind's eye, seeing it emerge like opening a gift. If you cannot recall a moment that happened this past week, perhaps this week you will notice these moments more deeply. The second question is this. How did you offer yourself as a gift of presence? What did it feel like to extend your attentiveness and availability beyond yourself? Did you notice how it made a difference to someone else for you to be truly present to them? The third question is this, is it possible that God's presence is felt more acutely in these moments when we truly tend to one another? If so, what could you do this coming week that would allow God's gift of joy to flow, flow through you to someone else? It may be as simple as finding opportunities to speak an encouraging word, or as complex as actually lifting up someone's circumstances through volunteering or donating. In this prayerful present moment, we turn our attention on those who we know are in distress. We lift up those in our community, Dan Butcher, Scott Sandoval, the family and friends of Morrow. If you have a name you would like to call out, please feel free to lift that name up now. God, hear our prayers. In this prayerful present moment, we train our attention on thanksgiving and joy. We have much to give thanks for this week. We give thanks, O oh God, for your presence with us always and the miracles that happen each and every day if we just open our minds, our hearts, our spirit to see them. We pray, God, that we will be reminded that to be joyful is to enter into a practice of gratitude. 
may we truly live that, especially in this new year that is coming up. We give thanks, God, for the many ways in which you continue to guide us in our journey. Help us, God, to be the people who can bring justice to our hurting world in just small ways, because small ways turn into big ways. In our prayerful present moment today, God, we ask you, Christ Jesus, the greatest gift of all, to help us truly savor this journey toward the celebration of Christmas. Help us recognize and create moments of sweet presence rather than filling the voids with the things that do not last. Help us to stop, to notice what we are experiencing and accept it with open hearts and open minds. In doing this, we allow you to meet us in the right here, right now, right where we are. So be it. We've been given to know and believe. What we must do is open our hearts to the land all gifts go Those are some beautiful words. And as Pastor Judy was speaking, she talked about we have an attitude of scarcity. We think that there's not enough. And almost all of my adult life, I've practiced what I call the spiritual discipline of proportional giving. You might call it tithing. And it's, it's not about the amount that you give. It's about the intention in your heart that you know and believe that whatever you bring in during a week or a month or a year, that if you take a piece of that and set it apart and give it away, that you trust that the divine, that the universe, that God is going to continue to provide for you, that you don't need that part that you choose to give away. And it doesn't have to be 10%. It just has to be an intentional amount rather than just looking in your wallet and saying, oh, today I've got a five, tomorrow I've got a 10. But saying, no, I'm going to take this part of my income and I'm going to set it aside and I'm going to trust God for the rest. And so there are many ways to give. You can give here in the offering plate. You can go to our website. You can go, oh, no, we don't have a basket. It is a third Sunday, yes. Can somebody find a basket real quick? <laughs> you can also go to PayPal and um, a bank draft. This is the second Sunday, so uh, we do have a basket coming around. And the basket is for our Helping Hands Fund, and that is uh, monies that we use to share with uh, people that are in need that come here to the church and um, need something. Uh, it can be money for rent or it can be money for... So anyway, give as generously as you can. And there's the basket for the second hands giving. Oh, we found a basket. She said sing. Positions. I'm not going to rag on people, but I need people to help with ushering every Sunday. 
and I'm going to offer a training the second Sunday in January, if you'll come to that. I also need one person or two people to look after the library out front and just let me know if we need books and I can put it in the bulletin. Um, we have kids' books and adult books. So one or two people, you can check it on Sunday and bring the books the next Sunday. It's not a big deal. It takes five minutes, maybe. Um, those are two things that, that I'm focusing on right now, so please consider that. Ushers really are important because many of us, especially in the early days, it's different now with the younger generation. They didn't have to go through all the BS we had to go through when we were all coming out and we drove around the queer church wondering is it safe to go in. And some people it takes them months or weeks before they'll enter in. So ushers have to be welcoming, not overbearing, not, oh, well, let me give you a big hug. But, you know, thank you for coming today. Let me introduce you to one other person. There's a skill to it, and, and I'll give you that training at the, in January. So please pray about that. Um, ushers are the first person that somebody encounters, and they're very important. So, And you get to wear a little badge. It says usher. It's gold. Okay. So pray about it. We also need people to serve on the board of directors. Um, that deals with the business of the church. Uh, the building, uh, the money, fundraising, those kind of things. And uh, the last Saturday in January, I've planned a planning meeting for the upcoming year, and we're going to kind of go over some ideas of what we want to do, what are some activities, like make sure we put on the calendar, like if we're going to do the coming out day fiesta, pride participation. But what are some other events? Um, we talked about doing uh, uh, meals here, like once a quarter as a fundraiser for the church. And uh, we need Churches will never be like they used to be. And many churches, many, many, many churches have so much money that normally when God is a Catholic church, and they, they have other streams that they tap into. So that's what we need to look at. Many years ago when I first came here, I wanted to buy these apartments to go to these churches. And some of them, where are they? Not, <laughs> not the, these here, but these here, back there, the two stores. I wanted to buy those. And I said, you know, the owner wants to sell them. We don't have to manage it. We could hire a managing company. And at that time, the board I had, I, they just were afraid to move forward. We also had an opportunity to have a cell phone tower. That was taken, the board was afraid to do that. So the board has to be some people who have faith, but have good business sense and will trust and explore, be a sounding board for me. Uh, sometimes I'll come in and I say, you know, what do you think I should do about this situation? Or, so it's a very important job, and uh, pray about that also. And if you would like to come in and talk to me, you're welcome. Andy, can you stand up? And Gabby, they're on the board. And I think Sharon served on the board before. If you served on it, Ron served on the board. He's <laughs> our old timers say we've done our. You know, they've they've done. They're done. They're ready to pass the torch. So this is your church. I'm just the pastor. I'm not. I don't do everything. So please pray about this. I know God. I'm, I'm asking God today to stir some people's hearts, and I want it to be a fire in your bones, a passion in your heart that I want to do this. And if you don't like it, you can stop, and we'll find something else that's your gift, you know? So pray about it. God bless you, and thank you for listening.
You have prepared your meal, but you have received it. Thank you for the Eucharist.
miss our service on the Christmas Carol as a way of keeping you from the Christmas boredom of the next season. Or, more importantly, it is a strong version of 